Good morning. My name is Brad Coleman. I'm the pastor of our Christ Church Highland Park location. And first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone for all the support that you've given to us at Highland Park. We felt bolstered and strengthened by your prayers. Many of you have reached out with tangible love to us, offering flowers and meals to those who have been most impacted, offering free counseling. And we have more and more seen God's hand at work in our midst, midst because we heal in community. We heal in relationship. We hear, heal as we compassionately listen to each other, as we share stories with each other. And I'm continually hearing about people reaching out to one another, sharing their stories, listening, just checking in and asking, how are you doing? I want to encourage you to continue to pray for us and pray for our community in Highland Park. It's been amazing to see how the community has come together during this time. We have seen God at work in our midst. As horrendous as these circumstances are, we've seen God working beneath the surface. No matter what, he is continually working. And as this morning, we find ourselves in our last message in the book of Daniel. This is what we've seen throughout this series. We've seen this in the book of Daniel. God is always at work, no matter what the circumstances are. God's people have been violently besieged and plundered. They've been captured. And they're living now as prisoners under oppressive kings. And yet, we see God at work. Those kings rule by intimidation. They gain respect by mandating respect. They appear to have all the power, but again and again throughout the book of Daniel, we see God revealing himself and revealing that, in fact, it is he that is at work, he that is all-powerful, he that is in control. God is always at work. So as we move now into Daniel chapter 6, I want to pray for us. I want to ask God to open our hearts and our minds that we might be able to see this even more clearly, that we might be able to see that God is always at work in our midst, no matter what our circumstances are. He is always there. And so, Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your presence with us. And we ask that you would give us an experience of that truth. We know that you're right here. As people are listening in their homes, we know that you're right there in their homes with them. Would you give us an experience of that this morning? We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that it's a powerful tool for transformation in the hands of your Holy Spirit. And so we give ourselves to you this morning, that you might transform us, that you might show yourself to us, that we might understand more clearly that you are our king and you are our God. We ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's begin by reading this amazing chapter in the book of Daniel, chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. By the way, where we left off in chapter 5, Babylon had just been overtaken by the Medes and Persians, and a king named Darius had taken over the rulership of Babylon. And so that's where we pick it up. Verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them, the administrators, so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his excellent qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now we see this throughout the book of Daniel. Daniel continues to distinguish himself among the other leaders. But he doesn't find favor with everyone. Let's continue to read. At this the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, 
we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they could find no corruption or negligence in Daniel. The only way that they were going to be able to accuse him is if it was in relationship to his consistent commitment to God. They had to trick him in some way. And so this is what they do. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. They're buttering him up. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed. (laughs) Well, that's all except for one have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So, King Darius put the decree in writing. These scoundrels are setting a trap. They're hoping to get this Hebrew out of their way. Let's keep reading. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem. That was the direction that God's people were instructed to pray. Three times a day, he he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. That's a key phrase, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, notice how disparagingly they speak of Daniel. Daniel, who's one of the exiles. He's a prisoner. He's a captive. He pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. That's a key word, still. He still, he still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly enraged. No, it doesn't say that. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. The the king was despondent. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. They've trapped him, and he knows it. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. Let me read that last verse again. May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. Rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of, the, of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. These are seals over the stone to make sure that nobody tampers with it. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without entertainment being brought to him. He could not sleep. As I said, he was despondent. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, Servant of the living God, has your God, and again, he uses this phrase, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. I mean, this guy just 
through Daniel in a lion's den. And Daniel's first response is, may the king live forever. Daniel cares for the king. And then he says, my God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not heard me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Daniel just break the king's decree? And he says, I've done no wrong before you. Yes, he broke the king's decree, but he did not do it to spite the king or to wrong him in any way. He simply had a higher commitment that he could not break. The king was overjoyed, it says in verse 23. And he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And this is reiterated in Hebrews chapter 11 in, in um, the, the hall of faith, as they call it, um, makes reference to Daniel's faith, shutting the mouths of the lions. Verse 24, at the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and they were thrown into the lion's den along with their families, their wives and children, it says. Now, this is the rage of a pagan king. You notice this is not something that that God asked Darius to do. This is the rage of a pagan monarch. Before they reached the floor of the den, the lions had overpowered them and crushed all their bones. And in the rest of the chapter, now although Darius is a tyrant, he's he's a, a pagan king, he's oppressive, he he has suddenly recognized. Through this story, he has suddenly recognized the power of Daniel's God. And this is what happens. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree. (laughs) Once again, with the decree, I think this is the only way that these kings know how to get something done. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Now, we're going to be unpacking chapter 6 this morning. But as we do, as this is our last message in the book of Daniel, we're also going to be making connections back to the earlier chapters, chapters 1 through 5, because we see a pattern developing. And these patterns are such that it is clear there's something that's being shown to us through these patterns. There's something that we're supposed to see in these patterns. By now, you probably know that the book of Daniel is broken up into two parts. Chapters 1 through 6 are narratives. They speak of Daniel and his friends and how they live under these oppressive kings. Chapters 7 through 12 consist of visions in which Daniel's speaking of what's to come. He's speaking of the coming unfolding plan of God's redemptive work in the world. Now, in our series, we've been focusing on the first six chapters, those narratives that we see, the the descriptions of the stories of, of Daniel's life and his friends' lives and how they live in this pagan culture. So today, we're going to be looking at the last of those six chapters, chapter six. And I'm going to make three brief observations about who Daniel has shown himself to be throughout the book and who he continues to show himself to be here at the end of his life. In fact, Daniel's probably about 80 years old at this point. When he was brought into Babylon, he was probably about 15 years old. So my first point is this. Daniel emanates the character of God amidst 
a culture of power. Daniel emanates the character of God amidst a culture of pride. So let's first look at this culture of pride. What do we mean by that? This culture of pride that surrounded Daniel. Well, I've already mentioned that the Hebrews have been taken captive and they are now living as prisoners under these tyrannical kings. And that rule by the kings is done by intimidation. They motivate with fear. They manipulate others to give them honor and respect using threats of violence. But there's this trickle-down effect that we see. And this is a basic principle. When leaders rule in a particular way, it impacts the culture that's underneath them. A leader creates a culture with the tone with which they lead. That's a basic principle. We see this in the corporate world, right? If we see an employer or a leader who is defensive or pushes others down to gain advancement or criticizes anyone who doesn't think just as they do or leads through intimidation, if we see a a leader who lies to cover their tracks, who cannot admit when they're wrong, who will never admit defeat, who are willing to cheat to get ahead. This will create a culture underneath them that is similarly dysfunctional. We see that happening in the corporate world with employers. But we see it here in Babylon as well. Throughout the first six chapters, we see that the nobles under these kings are responding in jealousy toward Daniel. They bring accusation against Daniel and his friends. And in this case, in chapter 6, they actually try to set a trap for Daniel. And Jesus said, a student will eventually become just like their teacher. And this is what we see in the book of Daniel, in these kingdoms. Those who are under the kings eventually take on the tone of the leadership of those kings. The kings have created a culture of pride. But what do we see in Daniel? On the other hand, throughout the first six chapters of Daniel, we see him and his friends refusing to be conformed to the pattern of the world around them. As Paul encourages this in Romans 12, he says, do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And I would say by the continual renewing of your minds. We see Daniel standing up to these kings, showing concern for the kings, serving them with faithfulness, but never conforming to the kings. Now, the spirit of Babylon can be summed up in Nebuchadnezzar's statement in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30 to 31. Nebuchadnezzar says this. He says, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? This is a rulership of pride, and he's creating a culture of pride. But the spirit of Daniel can be summed up in I think in last week's statement from chapter 5, Daniel's in front of Belshazzar, and Belshazzar is offering Daniel, if he can read the writing on the walls, the mysterious handwriting on the walls, Belshazzar is going to give Daniel wealth and position and respect and honor. And this is what Daniel says to Belshazzar. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself. Give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Daniel stands before Belshazzar in absolute confidence. And we're seeing throughout this book a difference in stark contrast between arrogance and confidence. Arrogance and confidence. Arrogance actually comes from a place of insecurity. When we're not confident in who we are, 
then we have to prove ourselves. We have to prove ourselves and show our worth and our worthiness to others. We're desperate for attention. We're desperate to be noticed and respected. We actually then become self-focused, self-centered, self-absorbed, self-obsessed. But confidence, on the other hand, confidence comes from a place of security and stability. When we know who we are, and in this case, when we know who our God is, who our king is, and that we're accepted by that God who has made us, and we accept who he's made us to be, we're comfortable with who God has made us to be. And we know that we are loved, and we're secure in that position. Then this creates freedom. We have nothing to prove. We have nothing to prove, nothing to hide. That is true freedom. And isn't that ironic? Because time and time again, we see Daniel before a king. We see this king and this prisoner, Daniel. And which of the two of them are free, the king or the prisoner? It's the prisoner that's actually exhibiting freedom. Which of the two of them are needy and needing more, the king or the prisoner? The king is needy and the prisoner is free. So this is the dynamic that we see. Daniel emanates the character of God and the confidence of one who knows that God is his king. Daniel emanates the character of God amidst a culture of pride. Now, my second point is this, that Daniel stood out in the culture of Babylon. We see this throughout the first six chapters. Uh, Daniel is noticed for his wisdom. He distinguishes himself among the other leaders in the royal palace. A phrase that's repeated time and time again is, he was shown to possess an extraordinary spirit, a spirit of the gods. In fact, in chapter one, King Nebuchadnezzar says of Daniel and his three friends that they, that they were seen to be 10 times better than anyone else under the, the rulership of the king. Now, Darius saw Daniel's faithfulness and consistency in serving his God. And we see that in a key phrase in chapter six, where Darius says, May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. Whom you continually serve. And he repeats it in verse 20 when, when he's, he's coming to see if Daniel is still alive. He says, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the mouths of the lions? Dar Darius saw Daniel's faithfulness. He saw his consistency in serving his God. Daniel's job was not to preach to Darius. That was not what he was to do in the palace. Daniel's job was simply to serve. But there was a message in the faithfulness with which Daniel served, in his dependability. There was a message. He didn't preach to Darius, but there was a message that was clearly understood in Daniel's character and is in his consistency. Darius saw that Daniel was different and that he continually served his God. Now, if one of us said, you know, I desire to continually serve my God, we might immediately think, uh, you know, maybe I'm supposed to go into vocational ministry. If I'm going to continually serve the Lord, then the way that I would do that is, is by being in vocational ministry. But I think it's significant to recognize that Daniel was actually in a secular environment. He had a secular vocation. His job was to serve under the king. He was a manager. He was a manager of the satraps. He had a secular job. But Daniel's life stood out. In contrast to those who were around him, in contrast to the culture around him, his life stood out because a life like that, a life that's lived like that, a life that's lived 
with that kind of freedom and that kind of secure confidence stands out. It's winsome. It's attractive. It makes others want to live in that way. I remember when I was a senior in high school and I was getting ready to go to college. And I remember having the specific thought that, you know, I I had been partying in high school and I remember thinking, this is stupid. I'm only doing this because everybody else is doing it. I'm just following everybody else. It's stupid. When I get to college, things are going to be different. You know, we're going to have serious conversations. We're going to talk about politics and religion and, and philosophy. Of course, I got to college and it was way worse than high school. I just fell right back into it. I was an art major. There were, there were these two guys in the art department, these twins, Chuck and Rich. And they lived differently than everybody else around them. They stood out. They were actually doing what I thought I was going to be able to do when I got to college. They weren't following the crowd. They weren't doing what everyone else was doing. And yet, they were funny and fun-loving. They were excellent artists, but they weren't competitive like all the other art majors. If you needed help, they would come alongside and provide assistance. If you did well, they would celebrate your victories. I wanted to just be around them. It wasn't long before I I realized and understood that the reason they were the way that they were was because they were both Christian. But they were a different kind of Christian than I had ever seen in my life. It was through them that I ended up coming to Christ. But it was because their lives stood out among the lives that were around them at the college. Well, how is Daniel able to do this? How was Daniel able to live against the grain? How was he able to be impervious to that trickle-down effect that was happening from the tone of the king's rulership to those who served under him? Daniel seemed to be impervious to that. Well, we actually see in chapter 6 how he was able to do it. Did you notice that? Daniel had developed holy habits. And that's my third point. Daniel had developed holy habits. We see this in chapter chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, and this is what's key, just as he had done before just as he had done before. I used to be a competitive swimmer, and we had two-a-day workouts. And, you know, you, you couldn't see your times drop after a day of working out. In fact, you couldn't even notice a difference in your strength or your endurance from day to day. It was only over time, with consistency and repetition, that you actually were getting better, that you actually were getting stronger day by day. Daniel was consistent. In fact, the plan, the scheme, depended on it. It wouldn't have worked without his consistency. They knew that they had him. And they knew they had him because there was nothing that ever got in the way of Daniel's consistent Time of prayer, three times a day with God. Your repetition creates in us this soaking knowledge. Repetition, doing something over and over again, soaks into us in a way that just merely reading something or hearing something once could never do. Repetition creates this foundational knowledge, the core of who we are. It's what the philosopher Michael Polanyi calls tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is a knowledge that we have, and we're not even sure how we got that knowledge. We're not even sure where it came from. It's just there, and it's just in us. I know this well from being a guitar player. If there's something new that I want to learn on the guitar, I do it over and over and over and over again. Start slow, 
and then I build up a little bit faster. It drives my wife insane because a lot of people say, man, you know, playing guitar seems to come so naturally to you, Brad. I still practice every day. Every night before I go to bed, I still pick up my guitar and I still practice. And when I'm learning something new, it does drive my wife crazy. <laughs> but soon I don't even have to think about it. It's just there. That new thing that I'm trying to develop, it's just in my fingers. And I don't even remember having developed that knowledge of how to do that. It's just there. It's like an autonomic response. I don't even have to think about it. So what's the tacit knowledge that Daniel was developing by, by being in the presence of God three times a day? The tacit knowledge Daniel was developing was a posture of submission to the kingship of God. Three times a day, he placed himself and his heart in a posture and in a disposition of submission under God's rule and reign. Three times a day, he reminded himself, Yahweh is my king. You are my king, God. I submit to you. I place myself under your rule and reign. You have my heart. You have my life. Three times a day, he submitted himself to God. How was Daniel able to be impervious from the trickle-down effect? The truth is he wasn't impervious to the trickle-down effect. Daniel just had a different king. Whenever he was confronted by a tyrannical, oppressive, pagan king, he had an autonomic response. He didn't even have to think about it. It was just in him. It was an immediate response that said, Yahweh is my king. I'm standing before this, this king who appears to be all-powerful. But there was an automatic response in Daniel. Yahweh is my king. I answered to him. It had become tacit knowledge in Daniel because over and over again throughout his entire life, he was practicing a heart disposition and a posture of submission to the rule and reign of God. That's what we do in worship. That's why we come together. It's not because music attracts people to the church or Music softens people's hearts so they can listen to the message a little bit better. There's something happening during worship where time and time again, over and over again with repetition and consistency, placing our hearts in a disposition of submission to Yahweh as our king. You should be singing the, the words of the songs from your heart, but it's not about like just looking at what the words are and just singing. It's placing your heart in that disposition and that attitude of submission, that disposition of placing yourself under the rule and reign of Yahweh, of Jesus, of your king. I want to close with this. There's something else that the book of Daniel shows us. And chapter 6 is a great example of this. So let me just recount the story for you. And I think you'll pick it up. Here's the story of Daniel chapter 6. A man of God who had entered into an ungodly world and lived a faithful life without corruption, humbly serves and cares for those around him. But the leaders become threatened and jealous. So they try to find some way to condemn him to prevent his exaltation. But they're unable because he is blameless. So they devise some trumped up charges, unjust accusations that they're able to make based on his faith. And as a result, he's condemned. He's thrown into a stone cave that would presumably become his tomb and a stone is rolled over the opening of this tomb. And a seal is placed over the, over the stone 
by the authorities so that no one can tamper with the stone. Then in the morning, someone comes to the stone cave to check on him and and they discover he's alive by the power of God. The power of God has shut the jaws of his enemies and he emerges from what was supposed to be his tomb victorious. He gives honor to God and many of the pagans who witness this give honor to God. But sadly, there's a dark part of the story too. Those who had rejected him were judged and suffered punishment, the punishment that had been intended for him. Who am I describing here? And this is Daniel, yes. But this is Jesus. See, this is what the Old Testament does. Throughout the Old Testament, God is preparing his people to understand his plan of redemption. God is preparing his people to recognize the coming of the Messiah. And over and over again throughout the Old Testament, arrows are pointing toward the central moment of human history, the central moment of God's redemptive plan for the world. When Jesus, the Messiah, the blameless one, would enter into a corrupt world, He would live faithfully and without sin. But the leaders around him would become jealous and would plot against him. But unable to bring up actual charges against him, they bring false and unjust charges against him. And he's condemned. He's placed in a stone tomb. The stone is rolled over the opening. It's sealed by the authorities so that no one would tamper with it. But in the morning, when someone comes to check, they find that he is alive, that he's become victorious over sin and death, and God, through his power, has been able to shut the jaws of his enemies, and he is able to live victorious. We have an opportunity to recognize that God has given us a relationship with him that was not available because of our sin, but through Jesus and through the work on the cross is now available to us so that on a regular basis, without fail, we can connect with his life so that the life of God would emanate from us in a culture of pride so that our lives would stand out as being different than those that we live around. And so that we would have opportunity, as Daniel did, to develop holy habits that would transform our lives, that would cause us to to, to carry in our bodies automatic responses when we're faced with pride and faced with challenge and faced with trial, that our lives would respond automatically to say, Yahweh is my king. My life is his. I belong to him. May that be true of us. May each of us become like Daniel in this way. May each of us reflect the life of Jesus in our world in this way. I want to pray for us. Father, we thank you this morning for this amazing story. We thank you for the privilege that we have of walking with you, Yahweh. The privilege that we have of developing holy habits, consistently placing our heart in a disposition of surrender to the rule and reign of our God. And Jesus, may your life emanate from us that we would live differently, that our lives would stand out, that we would live lives that are winsome and attractive and cause others to desire to live in the same way. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that as we go today, we would go more fully your vessels, vessels of your life, 
of your love, that we would open our mouths and speak words of healing and power and life into all those that we come in contact with. May we be like Daniel in the midst of this culture that we live in. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.